All right, well, good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you are. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Thank you for attending EREF's science session titled Unnatural Selection, Evolution of PFAS Policy with speakers Dan Germain from the National Waste and Recycling Association and Sean McGinnis from the Coefficient Group. My name is Brian Staley. I'm the president and CEO of the Environmental Research and Education Foundation. A few quick opening comments and some housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with EREF, we are a nonprofit research foundation, have uh, various programs that advance science through research, through data aggregation, through educational activities, and through scholarships. Um, the science sessions that we started a few weeks ago, this is our second installment of science sessions. These are intended to be short, 45 to 60 minutes of content related to the science of waste management. Uh, we have a specific series right now focused on PFAS. Um, the idea here is to learn about current research findings, data, case studies, and similar content of a technical nature. Um, for those of you who are interested, we do offer certificates of attendance and follow-up emails, and that will be coming your way on February 15th. Our next science session, se science session after this one is going to be called Weighing the Options, Current Strategies for Managing PFAS and Leachate. That's going to be in a couple of weeks, towards the end of February here. Keep an eye out for that, and we uh, look forward to uh, to you attending that one as well. Uh, we can't do these without uh, sponsors, and I'd like to thank our sponsors for the session today, Civil Environmental Consultants, Gold Associates, Labella, and Republic Services. So with that, a few housekeeping items. All participants are muted. Please submit any questions you have through the presentation platform. And if you need something, send a message to our organizers. We'll be happy to get you squared away. Um, and I've already mentioned the certificate of attendance. So um, with that, uh, let, let me just give a little brief, brief background before we get to our speakers. So Evan, evolution is a natural process that selects for genes that provide a benefit to a population of living organisms. It's usually in response to environmental changes. A man -made, as a man-made substance, the evolution of thousands of PFAS variants has been anything but natural. And um, let's take a quick walk through the annals of history uh, for PFAS to set up our conversation today. Um, looking back in the early 1900s, we see uh, PFOA, PFOS production first begins. And then in the 1950s, there was the discovery of Scotchgard as an emergence as a stain of water repellent consumer goods. Interestingly, I, I saw just the other day uh, something on social media says that said the best way to keep your sofa clean is to impregnate your sofa with Scotchgard. And um, I first thought that was some kind of... Uh, uh, of message from the 1950s, that was a post that someone made about a week ago. So, um, you know, clearly there, there's a there's a lot of conversation happening all around PFAS, and some of it is a lack of awareness about some of the concerns. Um, in the 1960s, Teflon was approved to be used in cookware as well as food wrappers through the zonal product, and then with a firefighting foam developed by the Navy. In the 1980s, China jumped in, began to produce PFAS. And uh, that began really global production of PFAS by, by various countries, including the United States. And then around in the early 2000s, we sort of pumped the brakes on things. Uh, there were some uh, adverse health effects discovered, and the U.S. began to reduce the use of PFOS, PFOA, and PFNA. And then in 2006, the EPA initiated a stewardship program for the voluntary phase-out of PFOA and PFOS, which uh, has essentially occurred here in the United States, but not necessarily elsewhere. Then in 2009, the EPA published provisional health advisory limits for PFOA and PFOS, and then uh, in 2016, the EPA issued a lifetime health, health advisory for PFOA and PFOS. And the PFOA and PFOS are the, are the legacy compounds that, have, as we called it today, the um, thousands of other variants are still um, under various points of discussion uh, from the scientific perspective, from the regulatory perspective, and so on, some of which we'll get into today. So. Here we are, nearly 80 years since PFAS was first conceived. It's been over the last 10 years that we've seen substantial discussion related to the health and environmental concerns, with really most of the discussion around regulatory policy taking place in the last two years. So policymaking is an important piece of the puzzle around this issue, as it impacts significantly how affected industries respond um, and manage PFAS. And while science should play a critical role in policymaking, in many cases, the science may be incomplete or further research is needed to better understand implications. Therefore, understanding industry perspectives, as we did during the last science session a few weeks ago, um, and understanding policymaking activities are necessary steps 
to help frame out what science should be done, what questions need to be answered, and what the future holds relative to PFAS management. So I've got a couple of folks on the line today who are going to talk to us about the policy implications of PFAS, where things are at. Um, these folks understand policy making that would, in, in a way that would, uh, around PFAS, in a way that would make elected officials jealous. So Anne Germain is one of our uh, speakers today. She is the Chief Operating Officer and Senior Vice President of Regulatory Affairs for the National Waste and Recycling Association. She's got over 30 years of, of industry experience that includes extensive background in, in industry trend analysis, contracting, engineering, operations, and compliance. She's a professional engineer and bo board certified environmental engineer with a master's in civil engineering from the University of Delaware, as well as a BS at Virginia Tech. Sean McGinnis is our other speaker today. He's a partner with the Coefficient Group, a DC-based strategic advisory firm specialized in energy, climate, and environmental policy and markets. Um, Sean has policy expertise that spans from the water, energy, land use nexus, and builds and, and includes infrastructure and public-private partnerships, digitalization of decarbonization, and market-driven sustainability solutions. Sean, you're giving me a mouthful here. Um, he also has a master's degree from Virginia Tech and a BS from the University of Illinois. I've uh, got a couple of Hokies on the line here. So with that, um, Sean, why don't you lead us off and um, give us a, a sense for what's happening at the federal level. I mean, the 116th Congress, that's the current Congress, right? We're not talking about a Congress from uh, from a couple of years ago. So this is the current discussions that are happening, and you want to give us some the framework on what's happening at the federal level. Yeah, thanks, Brian, and thanks for having me. Um, you know, looking at your timeline, uh, one item that would come right after that early in 2019 um, was uh, when EPA put out their uh, PFAS uh, action plan. Uh, that was February 2019. And at that time, I think there was a lot of stakeholders that felt that there wasn't uh, enough action taking place um, and, and maybe it wasn't happening quick enough. Um, so the 116th Congress was the, the, the former Congress, and we'll talk about the new Congress of the 117th. But uh, at that time in 2000, uh, early 2019, what we saw was significant uh, political uh, pressure. Um, we saw over 35 standalone uh, bills introduced, and this was across Democrats, it was across Republicans. Um, we saw multiple hearings on PFAS being held. And ultimately what happened was, um, and, and, and we're gonna hear more about this, we'll talk more about it. Uh, those 35 bills uh, ultimately were rolled up underneath some uh, annual legislation that's known as the National Defense Authorization Act. The, uh, well, you'll hear us talk about it as the NDAA. So the NDAA for 2020 um, is this annual legislation that sets the policies and funding levels for the Department of Defense. It's sort of a must pass legislation. Um, what we saw was on the House and Senate side, uh, numerous bills getting added to their NDAAs and otherwise passed. However, uh, when it came time to negotiations of a final NDAA bill, some of the more controversial provisions of PFAS um, were otherwise removed. And this includes things like directing EPA to set drinking water standards, uh, directing EPA to designate these uh, PFO and PFAS compounds as hazardous, uh, hazardous substances under CERCLA, uh, as well as uh, some items related to the Clean Water Act. So those more contentious provisions did not make it through. That being said, um, several PFAS provisions did. It cuts across Department of Defense, EPA, as well as USGS. And you're gonna hear us talk about that today in this discussion. Um, so that took place right at the end of 2019. Now let's fast forward a little bit. Um, those provisions that were not included um, upset some members of Congress. And on the House side in January 2020, and you're going to hear us more talk about the, this legislative vehicle, the House introduced what was H.R. 535, which is the PFAS Action Act. This included those provisions that were otherwise left out in others. 
Um, it swiftly passed the House. It was more of kind of a symbolic move. The Senate uh, remained opposed. Um, and then fast forward again a little bit, what happened, the pandemic hit. So we haven't seen substantial legislation up until towards the end of 2020. And what happened again? Uh, another cycle with uh, the National Defense Authorization Act for 2021. This time it did include some provisions for PFAS. However, they were more centric to DOD, um, things around remediation funding and technology, um, federal research and, and, and some other provisions. And then the last legislative piece that I would mention that happened right at the end of last year was the large um, appropriations bill, the omnibus spending bill. That there included nearly 300 million towards PFAS regulation uh, and cleanup. Uh, and it also included one provision that I wanna highlight, which was directing the FDA to look at food packaging and the potential risks uh, from PFAS. So that's a kind of a quick snapshot on the legislative, federal legislative side. So based on that, I mean, so so really, if I if I hear you correctly, the NDAA is in essence this uh, bucketless legislation that includes all of these various components that uh, have have ended up in as policy in various forms. And if I heard you correctly, what you said a moment ago is that some of the stuff that did not get passed as part of the NDAA uh, in 2019 were placed in some additional legislation, and that did get passed. So. Is there? It sounds like all the legisl other legislatures are pretty much getting everything they they want in terms of this proposed legislation. It all seems to be passing. Is there is there anything that that didn't get through that that's substantial that you would mention at this point in time, or is pretty much that all of this that got thrown into the NDAA bucket um, pretty much been passed at this point? So the NDAA items were passed into law. Uh, the the pieces around the PFAS Action Act, those more controversial provisions only passed the House, so it never uh, passed into law. And we'll talk more about that as it relates to the current 117th Congress, because we're gonna see the revival of that legislation. That being said, for, for the viewers, I think that's important, um, is that the, the NDAA provisions that were passed into law, uh, you know, we've seen outcomes from that already take place. Uh, this last year, 2020, uh, multiple items that came out of EPA that were otherwise required um, under that legislation. Okay, and that you mentioned EPA, that's a great segue. Let's go over to Ann. And why don't you tell us about what is happening at the EPA on the legislative front as it relates to PFAS? Sure, uh, so regulatory, not legislative. Um, and so the implication, I think, in all this makes it seem as if um, you need legislation to actually do anything about PFAS, but EPA has quite a number of um, regulations that already give them authority to make uh, take action on PFAS. Um, and so some of those uh, actions have been going on, and some of them are uh, a direct result of some of the legislation that uh, Sean has mentioned. So just kind of to give a little bit of an overview, um, there are numerous different uh, laws. So for example, there's TOSCA. TOSCA Toxic Substances Control Act, which uh, regulates uh, significant new use rules. Um, and so they've uh, governed, uh, had some restrictions on manufacturing and importation of certain PFAS uh, over the last um, uh, few cycles in 2002, 2007, 2013, and 2015. So um, this basically prevents um, uh, or restricts some of the manufacturing and importation of uh, certain materials. So as an example, um, uh, SWIC Sport, uh, they manufacture or they import a ski wax. And so one of the things that they were doing, they were importing ski wax that had uh, PFAS compounds that were restricted by uh, SNR. And as a result, EPA came to a $1 million settlement with them last uh, summer. And that required that they do a lot of education about PFAS and ski wax. Um, including requiring that they do education at an event with more than 10,000 people. And um, I'm gonna guess that they haven't complied with that. Um, but that just goes to say that um, EPA already has that vehicle in place 
to regulate uh, the manufacturing importation. They also are um, develop test methodologies for uh, determining PFAS. And here uh, they have test methodologies that have been approved for uh, drinking water, uh, EPA test method, method 537.1. They also have one uh, 8327, which uh, regulates uh, or it's a test approved test methodology for uh, drinking water and, and uh, I'm sorry, groundwater, surface water, and wastewater. Currently, there's no approved test methodology for leachate. Um, so we're kind of, even though looking at leachate with it, it we're kind of going a little bit ahead. Um, that test method is coming soon. It's uh, SW846. It'll be an isotope, isotope solution method, and they're deliberate. Del they are developing it in collaboration with the Department of Defense. Um, but at, as of right now, there's no specific test method that has been approved for leachate. Although that's not to say that testing for leachate isn't happening. It, it, is, it is, of course, happening, but um, that's just to kind of give a flavor of, you know, what's happening first um, in test method or, or the testing. Um, the UCMRs that uh, Sean mentioned, some of the legislation is adding additional uh, PFAS to UCMR 5, but UCMR is uh, required by the Safe Drinking Water Act. It's the uncontaminated uh, unregulated contaminant monitoring rule. And so every um, few years, EPA takes 30 unregulated contaminants and requires um, uh, public drinking water uh, sources to test for those. And uh, on the third one, they tested for six PFAS, of which PFO and PFAS were found in a number of uh, drinking water sources, which uh, raised a lot of alarm. Uh, across the country. And as Brian, you've already mentioned, EPA developed health advisories um, that they incorporated. Um, so in May of 2016, they did uh, issue a health advisory of 70 parts per trillion, which is, which is a very small number. Um, and this is for drinking water, uh, but for, you know, lifetime exposure. That health advisory, unfortunately, doesn't have um, any requirements for limitations. So uh, drinking water sources are not uh, limited, that it didn't relate directly to an MCL. And so uh, there's a lot of consternation by people that, you know, well, what about uh, an MCL? And so that's actually something that is coming. Um, EPA has made announcements. As a matter of fact, in uh, January of this year, uh, they did make a final regulatory determination to regulate PFOA and PFAS. Um, however, that has, that was one of the last things that happened before, um, the previous administration left. And so that has been stayed under presidential executive order, uh, pending a, uh, review. I anticipate that that's still going to end up going forward, but at this point, it is still, um, uh, frozen, uh, pending the review. A couple other things that EPA has done recently that are also frozen. Um, they had uh, the last administration, one of the last things they also did was talk, assigned uh, an advance notice of proposed rulemaking uh, to ask uh, for public comments on uh, whether PFOA and PFAS, as well as other PFAS, should be regulated under CERCLA as a hazardous substance or whether they should be rec regulated under RECRA as a hazardous waste. Um, so that was set to go out, but it's been held uh, pending review. And then um, the requirement for uh, adding a bunch of PFAS into the UCMR5, which is actually a legislative requirement, um, has also been frozen. So uh, there is a test method that was developed that can test for 25 uh, actually up to 29 new PFAS, uh, method 533, that um, was developed actually to support UCMR um, 5. So that all being said, um, there is also a draft interim guidance that was required under the NDAA 2020. Um, that interim guidance is on destroying and disposing of certain PFAS containing materials. And one of the listed materials that was mandated was landfill leachate. Um, so that's certainly something that uh, draws a lot of attention. 
So EPA, despite the fact that there are regulatory actions happening, does already have a number of regulatory tools that they can use to regulate uh, PFAS. Uh, so I've already mentioned uh, TOSCA uh, and the Safe Drinking Water Act. They also have the Clean Water Act that they can take action using RECRA, CERCLA, um, as well as EPCRA, which they also use for the toxic release inventory so that people know um, which uh, manufacturers uh, generate over 100 pounds of PFAS. So there's like a 175 um, different PFAS that are included under the TR TRI at this point. So, well, so this brings up a number of things I'd like to un unpack a little bit. For example, you, what I just heard you say is basically the EPA has, has a lot going on from a regulatory standpoint related to um, related to monitoring and, and related to establishing threshold limits, for example. But as, as part of that, kind of a common thread that, that you discussed, Dan, really is this idea of, of monitoring. So um, one question I have is from a, from a policymaking standpoint or a, a regulatory standpoint, um, we've got a, you know, a few dozen uh, compounds or a few hundred, as, as you said uh, earlier, um, looking for, you know, with the TRI rule. So why those? Why why those compounds in particular? And um, is that enough of the thousands of compounds that are out there? Why would those be selected over others if, um, and, and placed into a, a regulatory framework at this point in time? Is it is it just because that um, you know those have just been identified at this point in time? Is there some strategy to, to focusing on those specific compounds over the other thousands of variants that are out there? Yeah, so EPA did cull through a bunch of lists to come up with it, what they had hoped is a complete list of PFAS. From there, um, based on, uh, this is getting uh, beyond my pay grade, um, but from there they uh, determined uh, that certain PFAS would have a greater potential impact uh, to the environment um, or to human health. And so they uh, identified um, from there about 400. They have prioritized, I think, 72 of the 400, um, but the 400 that they narrowed it down to are ones that they're giving a, a stronger look at. So um, certainly they, they've got a list, like you said, uh, of thousands, 4,500 to 5,000. Um, of that, you know, probably about 72 are getting. Um, are under the microscope for uh, ones that they really want to take action on. Okay, and when it comes to PFOA and PFOS, I mean, it, that was those, those those specific compounds were voluntarily phased out years ago now, and yet we're still seeing legislative action and, and, and regulatory action on these specific compounds. In your opinion, I mean, is, is this really a mop-up operation for these two compounds at this point? And are we seeing the levels decline in, in, in the blood, in human blood? We're seeing environmental levels of these two compounds de decline for the most part. I know there's some hot spots, but generally speaking, I mean, is this is this really sort of a, a follow-up to say, yeah, all right, wait, this is really not as much of an issue anymore? Or are PFOA and PFOS, I mean, should we still consider them in, important PFAS compounds to be focused on? Or really should our attention be turned towards these newer compounds that have been uh, developed uh, since PFOA and PFOS have been have been um, voluntarily banned. Um, Sean, you want to take a stab at that from a from a, a federal level, and then you know, maybe Anne after that, you want to follow on to any observations relative to the EPA. Yeah, I think specific to those two compounds, and Anne hit on this: the Tosca tool of a SNR. Uh, you know, what, what it's really trying to do, it's not only about the use and manufacturing here in the U.S., but it's importation. So there's products uh, in other countries uh, where these two chemicals could very well be still, still being used. And otherwise, we need to control those articles, those products coming into our country. And that is one uh, mechanism to uh, help with that. Um, that being said, you know, these compounds, um, states are doing, uh, you know, statewide drinking water sampling. Uh, the compounds are showing up. Uh, we're seeing states move forward with regulations as it relates to uh, drinking water on those two compounds, as well as a few others. Some states, it's those two, some are as high as about six or seven PFAS compounds. And I think that just comes back to 
the amount of science and, and, and information, we have more on those two compounds than others. Um, EPA, you know, as we talked about a little bit, is doing a lot on the research side. Um, they're, they're, they're doing more as it relates through R&D, uh, doing, you know, uh, what I would call these um, finding ways to more quickly categorize and assess uh, to be efficient in, in understanding which ones of these compounds are, are potentially most problematic. Um, so yeah, there is some catch up that needs to be done, but the positive thing that we're seeing is with these uh, phase outs that have occurred, the levels are declining. Um, and, you know, due to that, there is, you know, continued uh, measures to otherwise increase that source reduction is going to help uh, with things such as showing up in landfill leachate, our POTWs, et cetera. Okay, yeah, and, and on the EPA side, is that, you agree with that assessment too, that it's still a necessary thing to, to regulate these two compounds? Well, you know, uh, as you were saying, uh, and as Sean noted, you know, with, with the um, limitation, you know, we, we are expecting it to decline. As you've already noted, you know, blood levels for both of them had declined between 2000, uh, between 1999 and 2014 by 60 and 80%. Um, you know, and the reason, uh, and pretty much, I think that like over 99% of people have it in their blood. Uh, the reason why it declined so much was because of the decline in usage. Uh, that being said, the amount, uh, the levels that were in people's blood uh, was significantly higher than um, the health advisory that was uh, identified by EPA. So the 70 parts per trillion is, is such a small number, um, and, and that's what kind of still causes uh, some, some issues. Um, as Sean noted, you know, the levels are declining and we anticipate that they're just going to continue to decline as time goes on. Um, and landfills really are not um, a significant, um, you know, we don't really reflect much other than what in, uh, people would be exposed to in their households. Um, that being said, you know, landfills are perceived um, as sources, a simple simply because they were uh, a couple of the early sites that were identified. There were unlined facilities that took a lot of industrial waste or manufacturing waste from um, generators of it might have been tied to them, but uh, this all ended up getting conflated with a uh, typical MSW landfill, which really isn't uh, a source for them. And so, you know, that's one of the things that we think needs to be recognized. Yeah, that's an important point. I mean, let's let, let's move to this, the the state legislative actions and and regulatory actions because I, I feel like you know that that point about it, that that landfills are a a a, a, a not a source but they're a sink for PFAS. And I, I feel like in many respects a lot of the state legislation that's happening uh, kind of get us into that conversation a, a bit more pointedly because there's a lot happening at the state level uh, when it comes to uh, surveys of landfill leachate and what the concentrations are in in this versus others other particular uh, materials or liquids that have that have PFAS. Um, but in some respects, when we talk about the um, the state legislative part, I mean, it feels like the wild west. I mean, it seems almost like uh, you know states are all handling things in some cases very differently, and in some cases they're kind of in lockstep with one another. Um, Sean, do you want to you want to take a stab at that uh, first? Yeah, I think there's a there's a few things there. So to start and kind of come off the conversation that, that just took place around the you know the role of landfills, uh, what I think is really important, and we'll talk more about it in this discussion, is that um, landfills are receivers of PFAS. They're not generators. They're not heavy users, um, and and that's been a really important um, communications education uh, piece uh, over the last two years. Is really kind of explaining the role of an MSW landfill um, as a receiver of PFAS. And uh, as it relates to having, you know, that sort of communication and educations at the state level, it's because the states are moving forward and they're moving forward fast. Um, as you uh, have probably seen in the news and, uh, and otherwise activities to date um, throughout a number of states uh, include things such as uh, establishing interagency task force, uh, to look at this issue, um, a number of states have re released PFAS action plans. So not only 
um, you know, uh, looking to EPA's action plan, but putting their own action plan together. And I think the thing that's important there is that there's been a few states that uh, I think have done it really well from a stakeholder inclusion standpoint. States like Wisconsin, states like um, uh, Washington have recently put out their action plans for uh, public comment and have had a real transparent, inclusive process and then have released final action plans. Um, other activity is, I think I hit on a little bit earlier, uh, statewide uh, monitoring of drinking water sources um, has been something that we've seen out of states like uh, Illinois and Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania and Alabama. Um, in addition to that, you know, a heavy focus on drinking water. However, what we're anticipating to see more of is a focus on setting surface water quality criteria. A few states uh, like Michigan, Florida, and Minnesota have very, very low uh, criteria for, for surface water for PFO and PFOS. Um, we anticipate this to take place in other states like Wisconsin, uh, but also New Hampshire and Vermont, who are legislatively required uh, to look at surface water uh, as it relates to these PFAS compounds. Um, as it relates to uh, activities specific to, to consumer products, to things like firefighting foams, um, we've seen full out bans, uh, laws that have been enacted, as well as things restricting those uses, um, bans on consumer products and food packaging, uh, have been established in states like New York and, and Maine and in Vermont and, and others are proposed. And I think the thing here that's really important is that's activity that's already happened. Uh, but what we're expecting in 2021 is for this to pretty much only accelerate. Um, Safer States is a really good uh, po state policy resource as it relates to um, some forecasts and activity that's taken place so far. In 2021, they're anticipating 27 states introducing nearly 180 bills to address PFOS. And this cuts across anything from looking at, um, you know, drinking water to uh, surface water, but also uh, enhanced bans as it relates to consumer products and cosmetics, um, as well as things uh, as we've seen in some states around uh, the application of biosolids and others. Uh, you know, uh, in, in prep of this call, uh, I believe, Ann, you mentioned that uh, just recently looked and there's nearly over 50 bills that have been introduced in 2021, this legislative session at the state level uh, as it relates to PFAS. So you, you mentioned, and we've kind of iterated this about what, you know, how landfills sort of fit in the broader scheme of, of um, repositories for PFAS. But kind of going back to a comment that I think both both of you have touched on related to the legislature, is is there a federal definition or state-based definition for what a PFAS generator is, or is this more a colloquial term that people are using to just describe you know, some sort of a product manufacturer who makes something that we then purchase and, and use. Is there other, in other words, are there some teeth to that term as a generator? You know, I don't, I, take, I don't know that okay. I've run across anything that uh, has like a specific definition. Um, there have been uh, le legislation where they'll identify landfills as uh, sources of PFAS, you know, as generators, and we will usually, um, jump in whenever we see that to basically say we're receivers of PFAS, we don't use PFAS, nor do we manufacture PFAS. So the only interaction landfills have with PFAS are as receivers. And we believe that landfills are a tremendous sink for PFAS, and you, you kind of uh, briefly mentioned that, Brian. We do think we need additional research to support that, um, because at this point, uh, we haven't been able to get really good information on mass balance and the amount of PFAS that will get mobilized into uh, into the leachate. So while uh, we're confident that PFAS aren't really, um, it, that landfill serve as a sink, we, we feel like there's additional uh, research that should be uh, undertaken to support that conclusion. And Brian, I'd, I'd add one point on that too. Um, from the federal level, um, you know, one of the things that we've recently seen out of EPA was the final affluent guidelines program plan 14. 
And in that plan was a study, a PFAS multiple, multi, a PFAS multi-industry uh, detailed study. And what they're doing is really identifying those manufacturers um, and heavy uh, industrial users, your uh, metal platers, your um, you know uh, leather tanning uh, facilities, et cetera. Um, but what they did within that study is they canvassed several categories as to potential industrial sources. And kind of getting back to differentiating, um, you know, a, a MSW landfill as a receiver of PFAS versus a user, a heavy user generator. One of the outcomes of that fi final plan 14 um, was the recognition by EPA based on the data that it collected um, that no further action at this time is otherwise uh, necessary uh, as it relates to potential affluent um, guidelines or pretreatment standards as it relates to landfill leachate. And, and there's some really good studies, uh, particularly at the state level, um, that I think otherwise support that conclusion. Uh, you know, I would uh, point folks to studies that have taken place uh, collaboratively with regulators in Michigan, as well as North Carolina uh, and Minnesota. And what those studies have otherwise shown is that landfill leachate's uh, PFOS contribution uh, as a discharger to POTWs for treatment is actu actually um, uh, significantly uh, smaller than the contribution by these other industrial uh, users. And I think, uh, you know, if you look at North Carolina uh, DEQ, as they stated after an assessment of, of this study, is that non leachate sources are significantly larger contributors uh, than landfills. I think that's an important point. Well, and that leads to this, this concept of where the regulatory focus is, um, is it, it seems, and, and when we look at the, the state activity, the federal activity, EPA activity, and so forth, a lot of it is revolving around what we might describe as end of pipe regulation. Uh, is, that, um, is that a fair statement to say that's really where a lot of the regulation is focused? I know, Sean, you mentioned earlier at the beginning that there were some activity related to, you know, limiting the use of it in packaging, but, but if you were to sort of you know, hold your thumb to the wind and say of all this, this uh, stuff that's happening on the policy front, um, you know, how much of it is focused on end of pipe? And um, do you think that's a fair uh, pathway for these agencies to be going down at this point in time? Or, or should they be thinking about uh, some other directions? You want to take a stab at that oh. one, Anne, first? Sure, sure. Um, so I think Sean uh, briefly mentioned, you know, the, the well, we both talked about the SNR under TOSCA, but you know, from a state regulatory environmental regulations um, agencies, you know, they're not used to regulating products. Um, you know, that's usually happens at the federal side. So yeah, end of pipe regulations is typically what uh, a state does. Um, it's you know, and and I think most of the manufacturers prefer um, that products be regulated at a state level so that they don't have to you know, try and comply with a patchwork of different um, rules with respect to where, what product is compliant in what state. That being said, you know, as uh, Sean uh, alluded to, you know, there's starting to be um, restrictions for uh, different uh, consumer products, uh, in particular food packaging. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, restrictions on food packaging is like generally uh, like California has it for total PFAS and it's um, limited to uh, you can't add PFAS to any food contact packaging, um, especially if it's intended for uh, composting. That being said, their uh, definition of what uh, non-intended, like no addition of PFAS is, is limited to 100 parts per million. So if you have 100 parts per million or less of PFAS, then you can comply with their requirements that no PFAS was added to your food contact packaging. Now, we're talking 70 parts per trillion for PFOA and PFAS, recognizing that it's only those two specific ones. And probably when we're talking about 100 parts per million, which as you know is 100 million parts per trillion, um, 
but that's going to be different PFAS, of course. Um, but regardless, we're seeing those PFAS going to composting facilities and being something that would be considered acceptable to be placed back out into the environment. So I think there's a, um, one of the things that we have to look at is, you know, what does the class need to comply with versus what do individual PFAS need to comply with? And, and that, uh, is challenging because a lot of people, uh, don't understand the distinctions. Right, right. Sean, uh, uh, from your perspective, what, what do you think? Uh, in the pipe regulations, uh, the right way to go, or should we think about other things? Well, I think that the um, source reduction is critical, um, and the, the the focus on dietary uh, these uh, consumer products, you know, our carpets, our you know anything that's in, in our own households, right? Um, you know, one thing that always comes to mind on my front. Uh, uh, comes to mind is 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 um, PFAS exposure, and if you look at EPA's health advisory of 70 ppt, um, you know that model. My understanding is based off of uh, assuming that drinking water accounts for approximately 20% of total daily exposure, um, whereas diet, indoor air, dust, consumer products are assumed to be the dominant exposure pathways. Um, you know, to me, this really hits on the importance of source reduction uh, and, and, and tools at the federal level uh, like TSCA uh, on the front end. Um, because, you know, I think from where I sit, if drinking water represents 20% of total daily exposure, um, why is it receiving what feels like 80% of our attention time and resources. Exactly, exactly, and and that's that's exactly right. From from the science that we've been tracking, I mean, that uh, that assessment is uh, appears to be spot on. There's a lot of variability in the data, but it certainly suggests that about 70 percent of our exposure as humans is coming from ingesting it, uh, potentially breathing it, and, and and those kinds of things. And and that's what's interesting to me because it seems like it's a bit of a mismatch between the policy activity and where we're getting our PFAS, as you said, from an exposure standpoint, and why not a why not an outright ban? Why isn't the discussion at the federal level saying we got to ban this stuff? It's you know like DDT and, and some of these other compounds in the past. Um, is there an active discussion around that from a policymaking standpoint, um, or is that kind of lost in the noise of all of the other activities happening with the NDAA, the EPA, and all the state state activities? Yeah, I'm going to say it's lost in the noise. Right now we have, uh, because of the voluntary um, agreement not to manufacture PFO and PFOS, um, those pretty much are considered to be done. And then for the other 4,500 plus PFOS out there, I don't think there's any attempt to um, ban any of them. Now, obviously you would have to get uh, SNRs on uh, new uses. But I think the um, there's very little talk about banning them. Um, even the FDA, I haven't really heard any. There's been some voluntary withdrawal by um, some of the manufacturers to say we have six PFAS that have been approved for um, food contact. We're going to pull three of them away. But you know they might still have three. That being said. Um, that's why we're seeing primarily those activities occurring at the state level rather than at the federal level. Okay, and um, I know we're, we're coming up on about 15 minutes left before we got to jump off. I do want to get to some, some audience questions, and there are quite a few of those. Um, but quickly, and why don't you give us some key takeaways from, for relevant to the solid waste industry on what we you know, get out of the discussion we just had, and then uh, Sean, I want to throw it to you for kind of a future cast of what we, we might anticipate. So you know, just so that we can wrap it all up, um, you know, give us some key takeaways for the audience and in, in what they make of all this. Sure, sure. So um, I decided to come up with some key takeaways from a perspective of a landfill uh, operator owner as a uh, you know, I was very much involved on that side of the fence for quite a number of years. So it's important to understand what the perception is um, that the public and regulators often view landfills as sources of PFAS. And, and this 
um, is the result of some of the early online landfills that might have had the high exposure. And there's quite a number of infographics out there that show landfills, you know, just leaking into the groundwater and going directly out to the surface water. And as we see those, we are trying to reach out to those generators of those infographics and say, please correct them, that those are unlined landfills and not related to the current line landfills. And so we try to uh, rectify this impression by saying landfills are receivers and not generators, but it is important to recognize that that perception exists out there. That being said, um, from the waste management and uh, perspective, you know, waste acceptance and things like that, currently there are no federal restrictions and we don't anticipate there to be any that would happen on a residential side at all. However, um, a hazardous uh, substance uh, designation under CERCLA, if that were to happen, uh, would cause some additional liability concerns to um, pop up for generators and transporters and disposal facilities, as well as um, commercial industrial waste uh, could be impacted by uh, potential ha uh, hazardous waste designation. Um, and then with respect to managing liquids at a landfill facility, again, there are no federal regulations, but um, for drinking water, we do, we do know that federal NCLs are probably coming. Yes, uh, that has been stayed and frozen, but we expect it, it will soon uh, be released um, and that it will come for those two constituents. And six states have already promulgated NCLs for a number of different um, PFAS, a minimum of two and as many as eight. Uh, as far as groundwater, uh, states are increasingly requiring landfills to do routine testing, and I expect that's probably going to be continued. There'll probably more states will start requiring it, and more PFAS will probably be added to it. Um, and then surface water, similar things. Um, as far as leachate, uh, the testing is uh, becoming increasingly required by different states, as well as by the um, wastewater treatment plants that might be the receivers of the leachate. With respect to gas management, again, there are no current federal restrictions, uh, but EPA has uh, funded some research to sample landfill gas for PFAS, and that research is ongoing. Uh, so we uh, look forward to seeing what the results of that. Uh, there's been very limited state activity. Michigan has imposed some um, screening levels uh, under their air toxics rule for new and modified sources. So um, that is in place, but that's really targeted towards generators less than uh, landfills, although uh, there's a possibility that landfills could get pulled into that. And New York is now considering uh, ambient air quality uh, standards, and comments on those uh, standards are due tomorrow. Um, so the takeaway from all this, to wrap it up, is that federal and state regulatory and legislative attention on PFAS has only been increasing, and we expect, as uh, Sean already alluded to, potentially 180 new uh, regulations and legislate, proposed legislation over the next year. We expect that focus to just continue to increase. Wow, so from a policymaker's perspective, it's like a birthday or Christmas uh, for, for these folks. But what, 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 does, what do things look like in the future then, Sean? I mean, are, if we're, we don't have federal regulations today, is it, is it coming? I, I presume so. And when do you think it's going to be arriving in terms of federal legislation? Yeah, it's a good question. And um, the current political reality is that um, you know, the regulatory and legislative action on PFAS is essentially primed increase under the Biden administration and the 117th Congress. Um, these activities that started under the uh, Obama administration, uh, plenty of activity under the Trump administration, and now Biden, um, you can only imagine, is going to be able to move pretty quickly on this front. Um, I would also point out uh, the Biden campaign and their commitments um, to designating PFAS as hazardous substance, as well as setting drinking water standards, um, is something that was well voiced during the campaign and has continued to be um, something that's been communicated. Uh, furthermore, uh, you know, I would point to Biden's pick uh, for the soon to be EPA administrator, Michael Regan, um, you know, former uh, top regulator uh, in North Carolina DEQ. Um, you know, as you can imagine, he has the experience uh, with the Cape Fear River issue, PFAS and Gen X. Uh, 
Um, he spearheaded those that state's actions. Um, so you know he is in a position to to act quickly. And uh, at his Senate confirmation hearing just this past week, he was pretty explicit when asked uh, about PFAS. Um, he said, "We will pursue discharge limits, uh, water quality values. You know we will take a very strong look." at air emissions and incineration of products containing PFAS. Uh, that was part of his response. The other thing that I would point out is um, Biden's uh, pick for the number two at EPA, Janet McCabe, um, very experienced former EPA air official. This reinforces the organizational's leadership at the top on this issue. Um, another uh, tidbit just this last week, uh, you have the new uh, White House OMB director, uh, Neera Tandon, and at her Senate confirmation hearing, she was asked by a Michigan senator about PFAS and OMB's role in reviewing these regulations. And she said PFAS will undergo an expeditious review uh, if she is to be confirmed. So these pieces are in play. Now let's turn real quick to the 117th Congress. What are we already seeing? Congressional members have already signaled further legislative action to come in this Congress that's controlled uh, by Democrats. House members just recently relaunched the bipartisan PFAS task force. There was a letter that was submitted to the Biden administration with 132 House members, essentially outlining some of those, you know, uh, provisions that we talked about earlier that were tied to HR 535, the PFAS Action Act. And to go there, um, we've already heard Representative Dingell from, from Michigan. She fully intends to revive the PFAS Action Act. Um, and then as it relates to some of the talks around bans and restrictions, um, she also has is, is, is voiced uh, her intentions to revive HR 2827. This is to ban PFAS in food containers. You know, although that this was not something the last Congress was ready to do. You can see with all this state activity, um, that it, it's something that I think would otherwise potentially have legs, as well as targeting PFAS and cosmetics. And I think one of my last points would be there is plenty of congressional negotiations underway as we speak as it relates to a green infrastructure package. And one would assume um, that PFAS provisions, uh, I would expect, would be uh, a part of that. Of that negotiation. So that's the forecast from up, from where I sit. Part well, of it. And, and in the mix of all this, we've got some some interim guidance from the EPA about how PFAS should be managed. And uh, one of the one of the questions that came into us is about one of the elements of that interim guidance, and that's the incineration uh, activity. Uh, is that a appropriate disposal method for PFAS? So, um, in that respect. What do you all think about that? I mean, I, I know that there was the, the situation where EPA intended to test the incineration of PFAS, They're working with a waste energy facility um, that fell through due to public outcry. And so, uh, you know, what, what's your take on that as a potential pathway for destruction? I know, I know landfills were also mentioned as a, as a sequestration strategy for landfills that, or for PFAS as another way to sort of remove that from society. And, um, you know, so what, What's your take on, on the incineration aspect? I think that's an interesting one. And uh, you, you know, there's lots of questions that come up with that. How do you concentrate it? How do you get it to a facility? But more importantly, I think from an environmental standpoint, which is where a lot of the lobbying conversation is happening, is you, you know, is that uh, potentially a viable method for PFAS destruction? And you want me? So, okay, go ahead. <laughs> Well, so, I was just going to give an overview of the interim guidance real quick, yeah. and then uh, so, so the interim guidance uh, that you just mentioned, uh, comments are, it, it was released in December, comments are due in two weeks on the 22nd. Uh, it does identify, um, uh, there are six different PFAS containing materials that uh, were required to be evaluated as part of that, and EPA came up with a hierarchy to determine what was the best way to manage PFAS. Um, their, their top solution was, you know, may, maybe you should just store it. Um, so not necessarily disposal or destruction at all. So like store it, um, which I, I don't think is necessarily practical for anybody. Um, and then after that, they considered um, 
deep well injection as well as subtitle C and subtitle D landfill. And then they did talk about thermal destruction, but from their perspective, there was uh, too many open-ended questions for that. Um, yes, they, you know, as you uh, acknowledge, they do want to do some additional research to try and get answers to those questions. But I think at this point, uh, there's too many unknowns. Um, so Sean, yeah, I would I would just add to that that I think Anne you hit it right on the head. If you look at the hierarchy that they've proposed, thermal um, treatment uh, is the item that they recognize has the highest level of current uncertainty. So that's reflective in the the hierarchy that they have laid out. Uh, Brian, to your question about what we saw in I believe New York and New Jersey um, as it relates to uh, incineration of PFAS. Um, it's it's an issue where you know EPA is working towards these analytical methods to otherwise detect and test PFAS as it relates to coming out of the stack. Um, that being said, uh, from what I've heard, it's it's um, been hard to uh, do the type of testing that's otherwise needed. Um, there's a lot of sensitivities around incineration. Um, particularly from environmental justice communities. And I think that the reality of it is uh, to fill those gaps, those, those scientific gaps that are identified in the interim guidance um, may be tough. Uh, and um, because of the kind of current uh, dynamic there. Well, you know, a couple of times we've mentioned this more than a couple at this point, and we've got quite a few questions in here related to where does research go? What research needs to be performed? What data do we have? I, I know that, for example, and, and that there are kind of two buckets of themes here as I'm seeing them come across. One is, um, are, we, are we doing testing about where the PFAS is coming from? In other words, what materials are, are contain PFAS and, and where do they end up? Are they ended up, they end up in our body? It then it gets flushed down the toilet, and it goes to a wastewater treatment plant, or does it end up uh, being tossed in the trash can and ends up at a, at a landfill in many cases? Um, you know, certainly um, I know that there is a tremendous amount of work to be done on that front from a research perspective. There's been some work uh, recently looking at PFAS in some discard, what would be considered discarded materials like carpet. Um, interestingly, um, some of that data that's not been published yet does suggest that um, substantial array of carpet materials do contain PFAS in, in, in some respect, and then there are others that don't. So there's a lot of variability there, certainly in food packaging. There's been some work done, about 60% of food packaging has been estimated, contain some form of PFAS. Um, and then once it gets into a landfill setting, we, we have some recent studies, and our various states have taken that on uh, to understand what's the percentage of, of PFAS in leachate from various specific compounds, and then as a whole, um, and how does that how does that implicate um, treatment capabilities at wastewater treatment plants? So there's various things happening that would I would you know categorize as sort of surveys of PFAS concentrations through the engineered infrastructure of landfills and wastewater treatment systems. Um, a lot more, but some information on where the PFAS is coming from relative to the consumer materials. So as you all have framed out the policy making, where do you all see some specific gaps that 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 additional data, additional science, additional research could really help flesh out this conversation and perhaps guide the conversation in a, in a productive way towards uh, where these policies are going. Um, Amy, you want to take a stab at that first? Sure. And, and, you know, Brian, I think you're probably the best situated to talk a little bit about what research is actually occurring out there. But um, that being said, to help support the some of the uh, policy and advocacy that we're doing on behalf of our members. You know, one of the things that uh, I, alluded, I alluded to earlier was that, you know, we have made some, um, some uh, statements about, you know, the trend of PFO and PFOS in our leachate has been declining. Uh, so information about that and data to support that would uh, really be helpful as we move forward with our advocacy. Um, and, you know, we anticipate that's, that's only going to continue as those uh, items were phased out. And then to also support the sequestration, um, you know, suggestions. So we uh, believe that uh, the vast majority of PFAS are sequestered in the landfill and they remain there. They're not very volatile. 
Um, you know, they're pretty stable compounds. And as such, you know, it's difficult to know how much of it is remaining in place without knowing how much is going in the first place. And unfortunately, I think that's going to be a pretty heavy lift. But um, hopefully, Brian, you and your uh, researchers are up to the task. I think they probably are. So, Sean, um, can you wrap us up in maybe uh, maybe a minute, minute and a half on where you, what your take is on that, and we'll we'll get us uh, to the finish line here. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I agree with Ann's points. Um, you know, we've mentioned a handful of studies, uh, the leachate to POTW studies that have been done in Michigan, uh, as well as North Carolina. Uh, I think additional research on that front uh, to really, you know, kind of, uh, you know. Uh, identify what is that contribution of leachate to POTWs. These studies show um, some, some uh, you know, positive results that uh, landfills are not the significant source. Uh, the bit, uh, you know, the study that came out of uh, Vermont as it relates to sequestration, again, as Ann said, it, you know, additional studies there would be very helpful. Um, but not only um, studies that have been conducted from the solid waste side, maybe this is a way for me to at least close out, which is, you know, it's the importance of PFAS receivers writ large. Um, what I would recommend, um, you know, to anyone on the line is really opening that line of communication with your fellow receivers. And I'm talking about the, the wastewater community, the biosolids community, the drinking water community. Um, you know, on the ground, um, there, there is a lot of benefit to be had to have that open line of communication. Um, and, you know, we know that these sectors are reliant upon each other. Um, so the importance of that, uh, I believe, cannot be, um, you know, it needs to be stressed. And, you know, out here at the national level, uh, those lines of communication have been opened uh, among uh, associations, uh, associations like NWRA and others. And uh, a PFAS a fact sheet has been created that. I'm sure if folks reached out, Brian, to you, myself, or Ann, we could share, um, it, which is a good example of that type of uh, collaborative activity. Great. Well, yeah, no, no rest for the weary. And, and certainly, um, with only an hour to cover a lot of ground, we will have to have both of you back in the future. Um, so thank you all so much for sharing with us today what's happening, um, a lot going on out there, and we will continue to track that, as I know you all will. And we will uh, circle back a little later in the year and, and have you back on if you guys would be willing. But thank you so much for your time today. And uh, for the rest of you out there, you'll be receiving some communication from us uh, about how you can access this uh, in the future, as well as the certificates of attendance and other materials. If we did not get to your question today, my apologies. Um, we will do our best to forward the questions over to our speakers today and see if they can help follow up on some of that. Again, thank you all very much for participating in this science session, and we will see you next time. Thank you.